In the 1980s, harder rocking songs were dominating the airwaves and the newly premiered MTV. With their heavy drums, metallic guitar solos and in-your-face riffs, these songs shared common themes of partying and girls. The glam rock scene coming out of Hollywood Sunset Strip, in particular, epitomised this quality. When Bon Jovi entered the scene in the early 80s, many of these songs fit this description. But as their songwriting took off, they began to look for inspiration in other places, namely their working class backgrounds. And in 1986, in collaboration with songwriter Desmond Child, Bon Jovi released a hit that changed the game. Living on a Prayer brought the hard rock anthem to the people, with lyrics that spoke to working class human experience and proved that songs that rocked could also mean something. It has become an iconic song that's remained a staple of classic rock radio, bars, parties, and the band's own live shows. Its rising, ringing chorus has brought together generations of listeners to sing in its resounding refrain. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvellously well. Welcome back to another episode of the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. Of course, if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. The band Bon Jovi draws its name from its frontman, John Francis Bon Jovi Jr. The singer grew up in New Jersey and started his first band when he was only 13 years old. John recorded his first tracks at the Power Station in New York, which was co-owned at the time by his cousin Tony Bon Jovi, and was where John worked part-time. The band we now know as Bon Jovi came together in response to a single written and recorded by John, Runaway. She's a little runaway. Runaway made its debut on the local radio station WAPP 103.5 FM, the Apple in New York. And as the song's popularity grew, John was offered a record deal. Keyboard player David Bryan was the first member of the band to get the call. Searching for that perfect gathering of like-minded musicians, John and David began calling other local musicians, bassist Alec John Such and drummer Tico Torres. At first, John's friend Dave Sabo filled in on lead guitar until the group found guitarist Richie Sambora. While John was looking for talent, the band was also looking for drive and commitment. Building on the success of Runaway, the band needed musicians who were ready to fully commit to a long road ahead. David Bryan recalled, John got a record deal and the band was formed around it. The deal was in John's name. John was signed to the label and we were signed to him. The cement was John. We always had that vision. We also saw the whole picture. As much as we were a band, he was the captain of the ship. But it was everybody's efforts and everybody's sacrifice that really made it work. You knew then and there, from all of the other players you'd have played with, that you had a certain heart and a certain amount of determination to sacrifice everything to make it. You give up everything. Bon Jovi was signed to Mercury Records and released their eponymous debut album on January the 21st, 1984. The album included Runaway, the band's first hit single, and was moderately successful internationally. Touring provided another avenue for spreading their music as the band got opening slots for The Scorpions and Kiss. Their second album, 7800 Degrees Fahrenheit, was released shortly after, in 1985. While neither album was a massive success, both did well enough to keep the band's hopes and record deal alive. The band's third album, Slippery When Wet, changed the game and brought the band unprecedented success. Part of the album's new equation was the addition of a new songwriter to the efforts. Desmond Child. Desmond had been writing with Kiss and other bands when he got the call to collaborate with John and Richie to create material for the band's third album. The title and the first song they wrote together was You Give Love a Bad Name. My very first day that I met Bon Jovi, I had a, a title in my back pocket. And so it, You Give Love a Bad Name. And then that's when John looked up at me and he all of a sudden I saw the billion dollar smile. You Give Love a Bad Name was the album's first single and the band's first number one hit. It was a hard rocking track that reinforced the band's heavy sound and reputation. However, it was the album's second single, Living on a Prayer, which would become the band's signature song, and which would reveal a working class image and optimistic face of hard rock. 
Prior to this, Bon Jovi had established their reputation in the vein of hard rock, tiptoeing on the edge of heavy metal. In 1986, Dennis Hunt proposed in the Los Angeles Times that perhaps John Bon Jovi was to become heavy metal's sexy messiah, declaring that the genre needs a young, handsome, macho singer who can electrify metal addicts but also has enough mainstream appeal to make the cover of People magazine. Mainstream acceptance, spearheaded by this messiah, would also help break down the radio barriers that had been lethal to the genre. And while the traits that Hunt saw as metal salvation would perhaps prevent the band from ever being accepted into metal's ranks, they were also the qualities which found the hard rock in common ground between metal and pop. Not just good looks and polished performance, but an ability to tap into the universal human spirit, admired by many, but accomplished by very few. Living on a Prayer was the song that first tapped into the widespread potential and reminded the world that standing strong and living tough could be done with hope and optimism. The song's opening builds layers of David Bryan's synth strings into a deep bass groove. Tico Torres' drums and Richie Sambora's voice box guitar sound catapult the track into its iconic driving pulse. About 40 seconds into the track, John finally opens up the song's narrative with a storybook intro. Once upon a time, not so long ago. And so in the midst of a rocking track, the band takes us into the world of any town America, where your local couple, Tommy and Gina, are trying to make ends meet. The opening verse sings, Tommy used to work on the docks. Union's been on a strike. He's down on his luck. It's tough, so tough. Gina works the diner all day, working for her man. She brings home her pay for love, mm, for love. The second verse extends the story and the couple's struggles. Tommy has had to hock his guitar and Gina cries at night as they comfort each other. The verses set up a familiar tale to many young people beginning their lives and trying to chase their dreams while facing reality of work and paying the bills. The pre-chorus and the chorus, however, offer the hope that the song has become so known for. We've got to hold on to what we've got. It doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. We've got each other, and that's a lot for love. We'll give it a shot. Whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, oh, living on a prayer. Take my hand, we'll make it, I swear. Whoa, oh, we're living on a prayer. Desmond Child told Louise Goffin in 2020 that the song's lyrics were built from an amalgamation of all of their experiences. The story of that song had our three stories woven through it. John Bon Jovi, working class kid, trying to do good, you know, with this six string in hock. And, and you know, that, that, that was so his story. And, and, and Richie too. And for me, I lived in New York City with my girlfriend at the time, Maria Vidal. And um, we were boyfriend and girlfriend for like four years while I was going to NYU. And then I just started songwriting full time. And she was right. She was working as a waitress at a bar a bar restaurant called Once Upon a Stove. And they had singing waitresses and waiters. And she had her waiter stage name was uh, waitress stage name was Gina Velvet. So Gina works the diner all day, working for her man. She brings home her pay for love. And that's where those lyrics came from. So, the, the, you know, when I was telling the story, my original name is Johnny Barrett. So just, I love alliteration. So uh, it was Johnny and Gina. And then John looked at me and said, it can't be Johnny. That's my name. Everyone calls me Johnny. And then we were like all like kind of, mm -mm. maybe it was Richie that said, well, what about Tommy? You know, so that's how Tommy and Gina were born. One of the reasons this song is so powerful is the way it combines those meaningful lyrics with hard, rocking instrumentals and John's incredible vocals. So let's check out the tracks. The bass player at the time was Alec John Such and is credited on the album. But it's commonly accepted that Hugh MacDonald wrote the bass line and played on the final version. So let's check out the bass line. I mean, it frames everything about the song. When I think about like classic Motown tracks, I always talk about how everybody's playing the same song. You think of Heard It For The Great Vine, it's dum, 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 da, ba, da, da, and James Jameson is boom, 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 boom. He's like 
playing the vocal melody, playing the groove, playing everything. And I think great, great songs do that. Not every single song has to do it, but when everybody's playing the same kind of motif, it just gets stuck in your head. So let's listen to that with Tico Torres' drums coming in. Big 80s snare. Nothing wrong with that in the right place. Absolutely superb. Let's drop in Rich's guitar. Keeping that same groove going. It's almost thriller there, isn't it? Thriller, da da da. It's like thriller. It's got that same kind of like foreboding kind of darkness to it. Drums are huge. Really exemplifies the 80s. It's bombastic. The lyrics and John's vocals are incredibly working class. And even though it was a very American experience, growing up in the UK, it still sort of made sense. It was definitely America. You know, we talk about the docks and all this stuff. You know, we, we sort of had what was left of that. In, in the UK, but not to the extent that we saw when we watched movies, like on the waterfront, I suppose, like replayed, but just in general, you'd watch those 70s and 80s kind of cop shows and everything. So this all made sense. We had that working class East Coast kind of feel about it. Once upon a time, not so long ago. Time I used to work on the docks. Union's been on strike. He's down on his luck, it's tough. I love how he has an affected, almost theatrical way of singing. Some of my favorite singers do that. Let's be honest, you know, Freddie Mercury could be like, is this the real life? It's just and Bowie, you know, Bowie was so theatrical on it. And, and especially when you're just listening to a stereo mix of something. I want my vocalist to have tons and tons of personality. And I know we always talk, everybody always talks about tuning and stuff like that. One of the things that bugs me about it is not when it's used, you know, in a modern way to correct a great performance where maybe a note slips out or two and you don't have a way of getting the singer back in. It's totally excusable and, and great, you know. We always used to do it, slow down the tape, whatever, you know, you put it into a digital sampler and pitch it. We've heard all those stories, even back in the 70s, they'd slow tape down so they could sing against it and then speed the tape up afterwards. That's what people did. The thing is, is that tuning used excessively removes all of the personality, all of those little inflections. And listen to the amount of personality that John Bon Jovi has here. It's incredible. Tommy used to work on the docks. Union's been on strike. He's down on his luck, it's tough. It's like an actor. And of course, so tough. he did go on to act as well. There's like tons of personality. She works a diner all day. So it's not just great pitch, great Working timing. Man, it's expressive. Mm, now let's get on to that section when it comes in. It's just so fantastic. She says we gotta hold on to what we've got. It doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. Just superb. I love the harmony against it. Gotta drop in some of the guitars here if we're on that section. <laughs> Bring in the keys. Now we've got to go to this section, of course. It's got to be natural ambience of the studio. And it's, it's, it's that period of like, 
which now actually is almost everything, like a constructed, written guitar solo that's doubled. Um, it's, you know, it's well thought out, it's passionate, which of course is how pretty much all modern metal is done now. You know, when you go back just a few years to the 70s, everything was like blues rock. And yeah, there was probably stuff that was written out, I suppose, 1979, 1980, Comfortably Numb guitar solo, I believe was completely structured and written and, and is one of the greatest guitar solos of all time, obviously. But you go before that, and it was definitely like a blues rock kind of thing, and you, some of the idiosyncrasies were left in, and it was expressive. But here is something that has expression, has fire, has a build, goes somewhere, shows off a little bit of the end, shows off great technique while still maintaining melody and feel. Like the birth of one of the great structured guitar solos to go in a pop rock song, a pop metal song, as it were. As much as I love Richie and I love the bass playing, I think Tico Torres is one of the most underrated drummers of all time. I think he's fantastic. This is pre-digital editing, this is performance. Just bringing it home. All of that, you know, you know what the vocal is halfway, you know, living on prayer. You can hear every vocal part of this. It's fantastic. They may not have been cool to an indie kind of rock musician, which was probably what I was at the time, although I was heavily jazz kind of thing, but there is no undenying that this is one of the greatest pop metal tracks of all time. Something that just galvanized loads of different people from loads of different genres all over the world and made them international superstars. This whole album made them international superstars. The rising bass and the keyboard synth intro gives it that sort of tension and that pulsating keyboard part which has an underlying drive. John Bon Jovi's vocals are absolutely fantastic. The verses have this descending and falling melody and they're a bit unusual in that way. He doesn't start singing in the middle of his voice, he starts an upper register with that tension and falling as we hear it in the verses. It brings out the tension and hard times depicted in the song's lyrics. And I think that, you know, we're talking about that theatrical element to it really does make you believe that this is a working class story being told by somebody with working class roots. Plus the descending verses are in contrast, of course, to the chorus, which has that rising woes which is optimistic, and it answers to the problems that are presented in the verses. At first, John wasn't sure that the song was the right fit for the band. The original demo didn't have the powerful anthemic sound that ended up being released on Slippery When Wet. You can hear it as a hidden track on the 2004 box set, 100 Million Bon Jovi Fans Can't Be Wrong. During the Runaway to Paradise fan cruise, John revealed the reasons for his hesitation during a fan Q&A. Ultimately, the song was so unique, it didn't sound like anything. You know, Runaway had eight notes, like a lot of songs on the radio at the time. Even You Give Love a Bad Name was reminiscent of the other songs that were on the radio. Living on a Prayer didn't sound like anything, so I was sort of indifferent. I thought, well, it's different, but is it a rock song? Is it us? Desmond has stated in multiple interviews that he and Richie had to literally get down on their knees to beg him to give it a second chance. The song had a majesty, a kind of upward lift that just exuded hope. And at that time, John was thinking about making a more hard rock record. So when we wrote the song, he was a little bit, the song's a bit sentimental. It's a bit soft. And he said, I was hoping we could rock harder. And Richie and I literally got on our hands and knees and begged him to record it. I mean, half joking, but half for real. Just record it. Let's see what happens. With the benefit of hindsight, we can now see how the elements that made John wonder whether the song was the right fit for the band sound are exactly the elements that made Living on a Prayer stand out from the rest of hard rock radio and transcend into a classic rock anthem for all time. The revised version of the song, the one that made it onto the record, is polished and tight. All the iconic elements, the synth introduction, the talk box guitar effect, the deep powerful bass line came into the picture as the band worked with producer Bruce Fairbairn. Before his untimely passing in 1999, at the age of only 49, Fairbairn recalled the moment they came up with the talk box idea for Richie's guitar. 
We were digging around in Richie's guitar effects box. I grabbed hold of this old tube and up comes this talk box. And I thought, stick this in. I haven't heard one of these since the Peter Frampton album. Fairbairn was referring, of course, to Frampton Comes Alive, the best-selling live album from 1976. All of these effects came together to create a unique sound, polished and yet hard-hitting. Living on a Prayer had the perfect makings of a hard rock stadium anthem. Tico Torres' drums, the rising woes of the chorus, and of course the memorable lyrics, halfway there, Living on a Prayer. Living on a Prayer was the type of song to get a whole stadium of fans singing together. It builds and gathers its listeners in before exploding into the chorus. And just when you think it can't build anymore, they throw in the iconic and sudden key change. You know, like at the end of Living on a Prayer, there was, you live for the fight, and it's all that you got. There was a big drum fill there. Oh, and then it went into the, and when I heard the demo, I said, hey guys, that, that drum fill sounds kind of corny, man. Let's just edit it. Let's just go, uh, uh, all that you got. And it's a bar of three and it goes, oh, uh, right into the chorus that modulates. So you didn't get that feeling of like, I write the songs that make the, I write the songs that make, you know, it, it wasn't like that, you know, because yeah. those, those modulations are usually telegraphed somehow ahead of the, ahead of time. Yeah, I love yeah. just like slamming down on a modulation because it seems like that's what's called for. Not for any other reason, because, you know, it's sort of like just it's it can be stunning. And sometimes it, most of the time it's a whole step modulation. I think in that case, it was like a minor third modulation. I don't know. It just like I mean, it was barely singable. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and living on a prayer, and John, John forever, like you know, curses me and you know throws you know throws me a you know a middle finger salute. You know, I can't believe you know we wrote this. It's so high, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Living on a Prayer and the entire Slippery When Wet album were produced at Little Mountain Studios in Vancouver in the first half of 1986. The album was released on August the 18th the same year, and Living on a Prayer came out as the album's second single in October. On February the 14th, 1987, Living on a Prayer gave the band their second consecutive number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100. You Give Love a Bad Name had hit the milestone three months earlier. It was also an international hit, hitting the number one spot in Canada, New Zealand and Norway, and peaking in the top five in Australia, Belgium, Ireland, Netherlands, Scotland, South Africa, Spain, Sweden and the UK. Living on a Prayer brought a down-to-earth, common man attitude to the age of hard rock and hair metal. The December 13th, 1986 Billboard review of the song declared, Metal muscle meets gritty reality and a tough, clanging rocker. The song moved the sound of hard rock away from the glittery glam metal of the Sunset Strip and to the roots of rock of Bruce Springsteen's New Jersey. Much like Springsteen had a decade earlier, Bon Jovi was now addressing topics that mattered to people. But more than just a hard rocking track with lyrics that meant something, Living on a Prayer became an anthem of hope. And it is an anthem that has transcended decades. In its excellent songwriting, it is also extremely adaptable. The song exists in different arrangements and formats that bring out different elements of its meaning and beauty. In 1994, the band rearranged a completely different version for their Crossroad album, calling it Prayer 94. In 2001, following the 9-11 attacks, the band performed an emotional, acoustic version of a song for New York, famously televised in a benefit concert, America, a tribute to heroes. Got each other, that's a for the harmonic colors, the melody, and the powerful lyrics allow Living on a Prayer to reach audiences in a variety of arrangements. But the song has never lost its original meaning as a hard rock anthem for the common man. It remains a staple of the band's live shows and one of the 80s most beloved and often played songs, even four decades later. A lot of the 80s doesn't always stand up to close scrutiny. I think the really overtly sexualized songs of the 80s get, they just don't stand up today, you know? It's fine, it's like when people are critical of like hip hop of a certain period where it was like that, then, you know, glam metal in the 80s was like that too. 
And yet here it is. Here's a song that's actually about a couple working together, trying to overcome, you know, poverty so they can live out their dreams. As Desmond Child said, that was written from the perspective of his girlfriend at the time, who was a singer and was trying to make it as a singer and was working in a restaurant where the waiters and waitresses sang. So it means something. It resonated with us even in the UK, where a lot of that 80s metal stuff really didn't come across. It was only the big, 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 massive songs that would chart over there, and sometimes only barely in the top 40, where they were like smash hits in the US. So here's a song, here's a band, here's everything that internationally really did break. And I don't think it can be underestimated just how important this song and the album Slippery When Wert were. They made me think very differently as a young guitar player, you know, growing up on jazz and blues. I took this side of rock seriously. You know, obviously I was Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and all the other obvious things. But like here was a rock band that had some of the 80s hair metal thing to it, but wasn't just disposable, you know, ooh, baby, baby, like most of the songs seem to be. You know, lots of girls walking around bikinis and stuff like that. It didn't have that. It actually made sense to us in the UK and obviously all over the world. That's why it was an international smash. So it cannot be underestimated. And I think in a modern world, it stands head and shoulders along all those other classic hits from all of the other decades of rock and metal, where many of them, unfortunately from the 80s, don't. But this song does. And uh, it is um, really due to the band and, of course, Desmond Child and the amazing Bruce Fairbairn, who we need to talk about more, we need to do an episode on, who produced this and many other amazing records of that period. Thanks ever so much for watching. Please leave us any comments and questions below. Thanks, everyone. Any other ideas of songs or albums or bands or solo artists, etc., producers that you want us to feature? So long, farewell, avidasen, au revoir, adios, goodbye. Mm -hmm.